Is it possible to play the video? Just play that. Because it is not coming there. It's a 10, 12, not video, it's a 12 minute audio, okay? Since we said you have to listen to the customer, this is uh, an opportunity to listen, okay? And uh, this is another colleague, uh, Mr. Rajagopal, who couldn't be here today. He was my co-instructor last time. So he has kindly recorded something and uh, he wanted it to be played so that... Most of the time. Hmm? Let's talk a little bit about B2B sales. And when we talk about B2B sales, most of the time we're going to be talking about spin selling. And by the time we finish seeing this little presentation, you'll understand the why. And before we go there and find out why it's so relevant for you, let's look at what you've been doing. <coughs> We just talked about customer discovery. What did you do in customer discovery? You asked some questions about their current situation, then you asked them some questions about their problems, and your customers told you what their problems was. So you next try to find out if your product or offering they were ready to buy, and they wouldn't buy unless they thought the problem was serious or urgent, isn't it? So you ask them some questions, essentially to find out how big their problems were. In split terms, you may already have been using what is called situation questions and problem questions and implication questions. And what you ended up with was trying to determine if there was an urgent enough or a big enough problem that somebody would buy your product now. You then went to two or three companies in that segment and if they all verified they all had this problem, that became a segment for you. Why was that important? You are a startup. So you want low hanging fruits. So you're not, you're not, you don't have the resources to develop a market which, where the buyer doesn't think this problem is so big. Okay? So that's what you've been doing in customer discovery. So in a way, you have been using some spin techniques if you've been doing this right already. Maybe not in a formal way, but you have essentially used this. Okay, so let's now understand why you need spin selling. What is, what is this thing about spin selling and business to business sales? So let's say you identified a particular segment, you've talked to some customers, and the most natural thing is that these guys are a prospect, right? I would imagine you go back to them and try to sell them. They've just told you the problem is urgent. How exactly do those sell them? That's what we're going to discover about spin selling. And why it's so relevant for B2B sales. So first let's understand the nature of B2B sales. B2B sales transactions are quite large. They usually have multiple stakeholders whose, whose approval you must get before, before you make the sale. You may not get to meet the most important decision makers. It's a big point. And one of the implications of that point, which you discover later, is that you need somebody, you need an internal sponsor who's good at selling and who's good at you know, telling others about your solution. Decision cycle can be very long, can be anything from a month to two months to two years even sometimes. The cost of a bad decision is very expensive to the decision maker. Emotion plays a much smaller role than in small sales. And now let's look at historically how people have been trained. Now these are the characteristics of B2B sales. This is the market for which you must be trained to sell. But let's look at historically how salespeople have been trained. Traditional sales service, traditional sales training primarily focused on one-on-one -on -one sales. Okay, in what, is, what, what is common about one-on-one -on -one sales? One-on-one -on -one sales characteristics are exactly the opposite of the, of the ones we've been discussing. Transaction value is small, usually only one decision maker. Emotion plays a very big role. Decision is made usually after the immediate interaction, so you get a yes or no answer immediately. Cost of a bad decision is not very big for the decision maker. So in order to make this happen, salespeople were trained to present powerfully and if some objections came up, they were trained how to overcome the objections and they were trained to close now because, you know, either close now or not at all. So that's what traditional sales training was all about. Now, they made the assumption that what worked in one-on-one -on -one sales would work in larger sales. And nobody tested this assumption was correct until a guy called Neil Rackham tested it. He went and talked to 35,000, you know, he was present in 35,000 sales calls, either audited the recorded ones or actually was there for a hell of a lot of them. He and his people, and they were able to analyze these sales calls at great depth. Their purpose originally was to validate that everything that was being trained actually was correct. And lo and behold, they found out that all the people who were very successful 
were doing exactly the opposite of what was thought. In other words, they weren't trying to cross right off the bat. They really didn't have to deal with too many objections. What they did seem to be very good at was trying to understand the customer needs. So these guys, if arising out of this analysis, that is how people can develop the SPIN model. Now SPIN stands for Situation, Problem, Implication, Need Payoff. You learn more about this in a workshop we'll conduct uh, uh, somewhere in the near future. Okay, these all refer to various types of questions. Everyone agrees that you know a good sales call, the buyer must talk 80% of the time, the seller must talk 20% of the time. But as I just explained, what really happens in the real world is that companies tell people make a very powerful presentation, they make the presentation, they look at the buyer, and the buyer says, Hey, I might be interested in this area, can you send a proposal? So they think they made a very good call, they can't tell the sales manager, yeah, this call went very well, we'll post this in a month's time. Next week, they call this guy, doesn't pick up the phone. Two weeks from now, they call the guy, the guy, look for me, yeah, you know what, we'll consider this next year. Boom. He never explored needs, he just presented his products, he tried to close, straight from day one, that's what he was taught to do. By getting good at asking spin questions, you will get the buyer to state his problem, you will get the buyer talking about the seriousness of his problem, and eventually you'll get the buyer to state the benefits of your solution. And this is all important. This is, I kept telling you, you will get the buyer to state his problem, get the buyer to talk about the serious numbers problem, get the buyer to state the solution. And this is all important. You know why? It's because if you say it, it's a lie. When they say it, it's the truth. If you, meaning the salesperson, makes the statement, it is a lie. When they, the buyer, make the statement, it is the truth. And it is true 100% of the time, Mr. Chikola. And ladies, it is true every single time. That is common sense, actually. If you make a statement, psychologically, subconsciously, you're believing it. You're already voting for it. You're already emotionally committed. You're already believing it. That's the power of making the statement. And if the salesperson makes the statement, immediately they're skeptical. But if the buyer makes the statement, then they believe it. This is the big thing about spirit. You're getting the buyer to do all these things is that the salesperson saying all these things. That's why people use spin plus a lot, lot more. So this is what spin does. It makes you say it. And how do you do that? You do that because you have used situation questions and problem questions to get the buyer to take what the problem is. Situation questions means questions that ask for the facts that are in the current situation of the buyer. Problem questions means there are questions about problems that the buyer is facing. When a buyer states his problem, he is in spin power and is talking about an implied need. So one of your first goals is to get the buyer to state his problems. That's how the sales box starts in spin. So, now, if a buyer has a problem, does it mean he's going to buy? No, not necessarily. And why is that? That is because if the cost of not solving the problem is lower than the cost of a solution, then there is no sale. In other words, if you want to make a sale, the cost of not solving the problem must be higher than the cost of your solution. So, without that, the sale will not occur. We'll get more into depth at this, uh, you know, in, in the workshop. But it makes sense. If you have a car that's giving you a little bit of a problem, you may not buy a new car. It gives you, if somebody points out to you that it's really costing you a lot in many ways you didn't think about, you may think of buying a new car. So that's pretty much what it is. So the next change in spin sales is that after you've got a statement of problem or implied need, you use implication questions to make the problems more serious and more urgent. Implication questions essentially ask about the implication of the problem. Okay? Now It's not enough just to make the buyers make this problem very serious. At this stage, if you try to present your solution, you still may not succeed. And the main reason is this. You are very good at stating everything about your problem, about your, sorry, about your offering. But the buyer is not yet good at it. He's just been listening. So the next job you have to do is to make him state the benefits of your solution. And you do that by asking something called need payoff questions. Need payoff questions ask about the usefulness of the solution. And in response to your question, the buyer begins to explain what the benefits are. 
begins to explore how the benefits can benefit him. You see the beauty of this? It's not the seller telling the buyer how good his product is and how much he will gain by buying it. It is he's getting the buyer himself to say this. When he does that, what is happening? You're rehearsing the buyer, you're getting a strongly committed person, you're getting an internal sponsor, and in the process, you eliminate most objections. Trust me, it's much better to eliminate objections than to handle objections. Objections are not stepping stones to the sale. Objections are a problem. I could for days and sales and I won't tell you that. I would rather not deal with objections if I can. So, when he begins to state specifically um, the benefits of our product, he was essentially stating explicit needs. It is only at that time you bring in your solution. When you bring in your solution at that stage, you've already created the the acceptance in him. Chances of his saying of, of buying the solution, quote unquote, buying your solution so that he can get others to approve this decision are much, much higher. So that's why practice are very really tough performance. They close a lot more. So that's what spin selling is all about. Let me just um, uh, summarize what it is that we have been doing. We have really tried to understand instead of persuade. We have let the buyer buy instead of trying to sell him. It is because of these reasons that spin is very, very powerful. And this is really the crux of spin. You use questions to let him talk, let him identify his problem, let him tell you how serious his problem is, then let him tell you the benefits of your solution. 